Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is May 3rd, 2013, and my guest is Richard Epstein, the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor of Law at New York University, the James Parker Hall Distinguished Service Professor of Law Emeritus and Senior Lecturer at the University of Chicago, and the Peter and Kirsten Bedford Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's the author of numerous books. His newest is The Classical Liberal Constitution, The Uncertain Quest for Limited Government, which is coming out this fall. Richard, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's always great to be here. Our topic for today is the Constitution, and I want to start with a very broad overview. How has the role of the Constitution changed the United States since the founding? How has our understanding of it evolved, good and bad? And that, of course, we could spend seven or eight hours on, but uh, why don't you open us up with a, with a general overview of the biggest trends? Okay, the biggest trend in the Constitution has to do, I think, with the change in federal and state relations from the time of the founding. Uh, the point here is that uh, the Bill of Rights was not wildly important in terms of judicial action for a very long period of time, and that the major battles were therefore over the structure of the Constitution. And the issue was driven in large part, although it's often forgotten today, by the slavery question. Uh, the central feature of the great compromise that brought the United States together uh, was the decision to allow the southern states to keep with their slave traditions and the northern states to keep with their abolitionist traditions to the extent that they had them. In order to make this work, what you had to do is to limit very powerfully the ability of the federal government uh, to regulate activities that go within the states. And so at that particular point, what then happens is uh, you give the federal government the power to regulate foreign commerce, uh, which essentially allows it, not for the best of all possible reasons, to introduce protective tariffs, which were championed first by Alexander Hamilton and later by Joseph Story. And you give it the power to regulate commerce within the states, that is, transportation going back and forth between states, and also to deal with the very tricky questions of the relations with the Indian tribes. And the rest of it was supposed to be inside the states with the state police power. Uh, when you looked at the judicial system, it was pretty much the same kind of an arrangement. There was to be one United, one United States Supreme Court uh, to review various kinds of decisions, but it in turn was checked by a Congress which could limit the kinds of cases that it could take. And it was also very unclear at the founding as to whether or not there was anything that the federal government at the center could do in order to override the decisions of state courts, uh, which invalidated certain kinds of laws on federal constitutional grounds, or more importantly, upheld them against challenges that were based on federal constitutional grounds. And so that what you did in effect is you had a, a kind of an institutional design which was intended to marginalize the courts in its original foundation and to leave primary power in the federal legislatures and the president or in the state legislatures and the state governors as the case would be. And so you have that as a kind of a key feature with respect to the original constitutional design. Uh, there is also the question about what is the role of the executive. And, you know, for the most part, the United States wanted a single executive with great power to execute, but little power to create law. And so what they did, in effect, is to create a system in which the president, and it was a single president, had the powers of a commander in chief, had the powers to veto various kinds of legislation had the powers to pardon various kinds of individuals and was charged with duties like making a report to the Congress about the way in which things went. But if you put the whole system together, uh, the basic way of understanding it is that the Constitution was drafted as a way to get rid of the defects of the Articles of the Confederation rather than to create the modern welfare or New Deal state. And so they had the president, which the Articles of Confederation did not have. It had a Congress with the power to tax, which the Articles of Confederation did not have. It did have a federal judiciary, which the Articles of Confederation did not have. And so what you did, in effect, is you found a way to get greater degrees of centralization. But the trick was to go far enough to allow the nation to operate as a coherent whole, but not so far as to allow it to squash the individual variations that took place within the states. That's the original design. 
Uh, by the time you get to the modern period, everything starts to change. Uh, the separation of powers at the federal level is looked upon with a great deal of suspicion, and we see the rise of the administrative state. Uh, the notion of enumerated powers, particularly with the Commerce Clause, giving the federal government only a limited ability to control the way things go within the state, is scrapped in favor of a system of concurrent jurisdiction where basically on any kind of important economic issue, uh, it turns out that the federal government is entitled to act, and in its absence, the state government is entitled to act as well. But the earlier version, this is federal, that state, and never the twain shall meet, uh, was never, in fact, kept after the 1937 period. So it's a huge difference between a relatively lean classical liberal state, small government, strong property rights, to a large state with heavy administrative law, concurrent jurisdiction, and lots of discretion uh, that's being given to agents at all levels of government. So it's a really very, very big change that took place. Now, we, you talked about the rise of the administrative state. Uh, explain what, what that is, the administrative state, and when that rise occurred and what allowed it. Why did that happen? Well, the administrative state is not simply a state which engages in administration. I mean, every state has to have tax rolls, property rolls, voting rolls, runs public highways, and so forth. Uh, the administrative state refers to the conscious effort on the part of government uh, to believe that essential industrial and academic and manufacturing, not academic, essentially industrial, manufacturing, and commercial functions ought to be subject to a very strong degree of uh, oversight by professionals. And these professionals are supposed to have the kinds of scientific expertise that would allow them to manage an economy, and the general constraint on them would not be a system of freedom of contract and private property, but would be the political oversight that takes place by virtue of general popular elections. Uh, the way it started was, of course, gradual, and the first area in which something was clearly needed, or people thought, had to do with the creation of a railroad industry, a network industry that went from one end of the country to the other. And so for the first time, what you did is you sought heavy capitalized firms dominating industries, uh, which were at a multi-state level. And the question of how it is that these things were to be regulated became a great challenge. Uh, so um, in the mid-1880s, the Supreme Court, in the case involving the Wabash Railroad, uh, sort of indicated that you know states could, under certain ways, bar, you know, um, control certain things that take place within their jurisdiction. And then when these decisions made it clear that there might be fragmented control over interstate railroads, in 1887, the Interstate Commerce Act was put into place, and this gave your first system of federal regulation. Uh, the control over rates that railroads could charge. It was, in fact, quite an ingenious scheme because what it was designed to do was to reverse the long-haul, short-haul inversion that's very common uh, when you're dealing with network industry. So there are four railroad lines that run from San Francisco to Chicago, and they compete furiously for business. There's only one line that goes from Omaha to Kansas City. And so what happens is it's not a cost-based system of pricing. It's essentially a system which says you load all of your costs of the fixed network onto the smaller portion. So you pay more to go from Omaha to Kansas City than you do from San Francisco to Chicago. And this enraged a lot of people who didn't understand that this was a form of Ramsey pricing, which means in effect that you put the fixed cost of a system on the inelastic portions of the overall operation, because otherwise you can't fund it. And so what they did in order to counter that was they required you to price the shorter portions on any individual leg at a price which was at least as great uh, rather no greater than the price of running the long haul. So they try to control this long haul, short haul thing. And then slowly what happens is the power to regulate the railroads expanded so that by the 1920s, what you did is you had a comprehensive system of rate regulation. And instead of trying to control these kinds of weird price reversals, uh, what happened is that you now had a cartelization of the industry courtesy of government. When the progressives then take over again in the first part of the 20th century, we start to see the creation of the Federal Trade Commission. And this is, again, a very large administrative agency. And a lot of what it's designed to do is to regulate um, trust-busting type activities. The Sherman Act had come on board in 1890, and the Clayton Act, which had expanded, it came on in 1914, and with it, the Federal uh, Trade Commission. And what happens is the model is Congress gives the broad outlines and the agency fills in the gap. And sometimes it's an anti-fraud device or a consumer protection device. Sometimes it's a trade practice device that's going to be regulated. And so what you do is you see more and more 
perception on the part of major people in government that markets fail for informational reasons, monopoly reasons, or whatever, and they want bigger and bigger regulation. And so this continues on a relatively steady trend until you get to the 1930s when it mushrooms with the creation of so many of the major agencies that we have today. So, so what you see well, in effect well, – let's, let's stop there for a second. When we look at that trend, and you, you earlier identified 1937 as something of a turning point, mm -hmm. there's a, a temptation to say, well, we were in the middle of the worst economic downturn of, of American history, the Great Depression – Faith was mm -hmm. lost in markets. People naturally turned to government for a solution. But in fact, these trends had been building for some time. And certainly the progressive movement, which I don't know when it started, maybe late 19th century through the first – its its expansion. Yeah, about 1900. And, yeah, around 1900. You get this view – at least this is the story. You get this view that there's now this cadre of experts that people are – who are clamoring for things to be expert about – uh, and and are trying to really lobby the public and the intellectual class mm -hmm. who are very amenable to this idea that experts should have more power. So this this expansion in the in the during the Roosevelt administration isn't so much a in this view isn't so much a counter uh, revolution to the excuse me a, a response to the Great Depression. It's rather just the the building up of a lot of of, of underlying forces that that push us in that direction. What's your, what's your view on yeah. that? Yeah, I'm, look, I mean, 1937 is in fact an extremely important date because it represents the final culmination of a movement that had been building for 40 years on two dimensions. One on the federalism dimension, it became pretty clear that there was virtually nothing with respect to comprehensive economic regulation that was beyond the scope of Congress to regulate. Whereas beforehand, it was actually quite different. Uh, you still had the older view that Congress could regulate interstate journeys so that if you ship something across state lines in a truck and then you unloaded it and put it into a car, the truck would be in interstate commerce and the car would not. And by the time you get to 1937, all of the earlier concerns about slavery, of course, long gone. And now you could regulate whatever you want by way of manufacture, mining, and agriculture within the state, which meant that the federal governments could really prop up labor cartels through the National Labor Relations Act and agricultural cartels through the Agricultural Adjustment Acts, which were passed repeatedly in the 1930s, hearkening back to an earlier period uh, when these things were first introduced under Wilson, who was, of course, a transformative progressive president. Yeah. But in the interim, you know, there are people like Herbert Hoover. So you get the Federal uh, Radio Act in 1926, which is under the control of the Department of Commerce, which Hoover headed. And uh, you see an expansion of government power there. Hoover also organized, it's interesting to remember, a, a conference which was designed to deal with zoning within states. And they proposed, they proposed a uniform zoning law, which became quite influential. And zoning was sustained as a constitutional matter in 1926, having been introduced as a legislative matter in New York City some 10 years before. So you see this pattern building up. And by there is resistance by the old court. There's some reluctance on the part of various people in the federal government to go the last nine yards. And then when Roosevelt takes over and the 1937 court transformation takes place, What's clear is that the progressives have dominated everything, and then boom, a year later, we have to worry about race. And it's all of a sudden very clear that this model of complete government control and a lot of state power and a lot of federal power is not going to work very well in the face of systematic segregation in the South. And so you get another permutation from 1938 through 1954, where eventually in Brown v. Board of Education, uh, the court acted as the superest of super legislatures when it struck down the whole state system of segregation after having decided that it's just absolutely terrible to strike down a minimum wage or a maximum hour law. Constitutional law does have this way of having strange twists associated with it. So what, what you're saying, if I read you correctly, is that the natural – I'm going to phrase it in a little, with a little hyperbole. The natural, the natural, hyper, the natural uh, trend toward Leviathan, uh, which is uh, in, implicit in any uh, coercive power, the monopoly coercive power of the state, was actually restrained ironically by slavery and the need for – uh, the original founding to show a respect for state authority that that was um, easily uh, ignored once the slavery issue was gone, and that that's the trend we're still riding today. 
Yes, well, I mean, it is very ironic, but it's quite clear that the cause of limited government was advanced by the institution of slavery because it made federalism a very important issue. Just the way in Canada it's an important issue because of the differences between Quebec and the English-speaking provinces that lay to the West Explain. and around it. A lot of people find federalism to be an awkward term. It's actually – federalism means – Explain it. it you, you would think it would mean the power of the centralized state. It's not what it means. No, no it means almost exactly the opposite. Yeah. A, federal exactly. System is opposed, yeah, a federal system as opposed to a um, unitary system is best understood by going back to the Articles of Confederation, dropping the first syllable. And federated means loosely affiliated one through another uh, so that you're not dealing with states as strangers. But on the other hand, you have separate relations, separate governances with some degree of co comedy or cooperation between them. And the so-called full faith and credit law, whereby each state promises to give respect, full faith and credit uh, to the judicial decisions and the legislative actions of other states, is a classic illustration of how federalism works. Uh, so what happens is you enter into a judgment against X in state number one, and that guy disappears to state number two. You want to go and enforce that judgment in state number two as the winning plaintiff in the first case, and the state, by having to give full faith and credit to it, means it can't say, gee, we want to relitigate that case in our particular jurisdiction so we can be sure that it gets right. And so federations, in effect, are loose alliances among states. And it's more complicated here because you've got the federal government on top of it. So you have in federalism to worry about state-state interactions and then federal preemption or domination of things that the individual states can do. So let, let me ask a naive question. Uh, sure. Which I don't know the answer to, and, and uh, it's the kind of question my my fourteen year old's been asking me lately, and I, we're going to get to him later. Maybe he, he's got a lot of questions that I, that I don't know the answer to. It's partly why you're on the show this week. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, isn't that exciting? Now, if if um, a state, a particular state, passes legislation that violates the U.S. Constitution, mm -hmm. uh, or might be thought to, and we have a lot of experiments going on right now in social policy areas, uh, marriage issues, uh, drug issues. Uh, wh what's the legal issue there? What is the ability of a state to carve out its own set of, uh, of legislation that follows its own constitution but not the federal one? Well, if you go back to the pre-1937 issue, uh, or period. What becomes clear is that there's a lot of room for experimentation, not all of it good. So the most famous use of that particular metaphor about experimentation comes from a 1932 case, and it's a dissent by Louis Brandeis, a case called New Ice Against Liebman, in which he says that the laboratories are essentially the the places, states are laboratories in which we can have experimentation going on, and it's kind of like the trial and error mode of scientific inquiry. This state seems to make it work, that state doesn't. The one state that fails will imitate the one that does good. And by having these multiple experiments running simultaneously, you get a way to compare and to contrast, and that, in effect, is an effective constraint on limited government. Uh, the problem about that is that sometimes you know these experiments are failures even before they try. And in the case of new of the new ice company, what happened is was the state, I think it was Oklahoma, which sort of announced uh, that, hey, you know what, we're going to have a cartel created for the sale of ice inside this state, an ice cartel. And, you know, you're trying to figure out why it is that you'd want to do this. And the only explanations that come up are forms of political influence and naked economic protectionism. And that was the thing that our friend Brandeis was defending. And the majority of the court said this is the kind of experiment that the federal constitution doesn't allow. And it struck it down. And this is what the complication is. After the Civil War, it was widely understood uh, that there were too few federal constraints on what states can do. And this, of course, is the obvious consequence once you decide to strike down slavery. So what they did is they passed the 14th Amendment, and the way to understand it is as follows. What it does is to guarantee people fairly extensive rights. There is something called the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment, which says categorically no state shall make or enforce any law that abridges the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States. And no state shall make or enforce any law. This is a huge prohibition on what states can do. It's a kind of a veto power, and it's to be enforced mainly through Congress by appropriate legislation. So the federalist system changed after uh, the Civil War, and what was thought was that you'd have state initiative only, but you had federal veto power. 
But what you did not have under the 1868 situation, where was the federal government could initiate those kinds of rules that the state had to follow, that came only in 1937. So the original version was you states can do all sorts of things, but we got this constitutional protection out here so that you cannot engage in various kinds of dangerous activities. And the basic argument is this. Federalism is good because it creates tax competition. Federalism is bad because what it does is it creates land use monopolies that the state can easily control through zoning regulations or entry restrictions of one sort or another. And the cleverness of the 1868 solution was it was an effort to have federal vetoes over bad sorts of states' acts while allowing the good states' acts to continue to go more or less as they were. So experimentation is certainly not a bad thing. So, for example, one of the things that you discover is you take states like um, Illinois or Massachusetts, ill-governed states. They have flat tax constitutions, which makes a huge difference compared to places like California and New York, which don't have those things. So, you know, experimentation on tax rates, I can understand where that comes from. But experimentation in the form of entrenching local monopolies is the kindest thing that you would want to strike down. Well, you know, we're talking about the administrative state, and I derailed you. I want to come back to that for one one more minute. Uh, Okay. Given the expansion of the administrative state in our time where we have agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency and the FCC and the FTC, they have much larger roles in implementing legislation. And the legislation is much broader and more ambitious. And it's inevitable, it seems to me, in those in that cur- in the current situation, because of the complexity of these of these regulations, that they have to work very closely with the with the industries they're regulating, which opens up the possibility of regulatory capture. Uh, I know that the ideas behind these agencies are lovely, cleaner air, better airwaves, mm-hmm. more access. But uh How can it possibly be a good thing that this communication – and I'll add the financial sector to it as well. uh, You know, my voice as as Mr. Citizen seems to be very quiet given how much time the regulated industries must spend in the halls of power. Uh, What's going on there? Well, it's actually even more complicated than that. Your voice as a citizen is indeed heavily subdued. But it would be a mistake to think that the regulatory capture model works unambiguously in, in all cases. The way the system is in fact organized, the people who wish to veto various kinds of actions are often given enormous kinds of power. Uh, so that what happens is you have an environmental protection agency and you have the industry groups that are lobbying for relaxation of certain pollution controls. But at the same time, they're well-organized um, environmental groups of one kind or another, which are constantly suing the agency in order to make sure that they impose um, even uh, stricter restrictions on what's going on. So the Natural Resource Sources Defense Council, whatever these organizations are called, are always very, very active in this kind of fray. And it's often very indeterminate as to who's going to win those kinds of struggles. First of all, the agencies themselves are often quite conflicted. Many of the people who are appointed to the agencies are not what you would call friends of industry. Nobody would say, for example, that the leadership under the Obama administration of the Environmental Protection Agency was pro-industry. The industry people lost most of the major battles with respect to that. So there's a kind of an indeterminacy at that level. Uh, The second point is that the issue about capture is is not sort of an inevitable byproduct of a well-organized scheme that somehow gets gets, um, gets derailed. It is actually built into the statutes themselves. The most famous illustration of this has to do with the uh, charter that is given to the Federal Communications um, Commission. Uh, which is created first by the Radio Act in 1926, and then it gets expanded jurisdiction in 1934 and becomes the Federal Communications Act. And the administrative agency was delegated the power to make all rules and regulations necessary to advance the public interest, convenience, and necessity. And you mentioned that obviously we need the system to make sure that there's no spectrum interference uh, going one way or another, and that's absolutely correct. Uh, But the agency, in fact, by the courts, took a much more aggressive view of the situation. And in the famous phrase of Felix Frankfurter in talking about this in a 1943 decision involving NBC, he said, uh, it's quite clear that the function of the agency is not only to set the rules of the road, that is to prevent interference on the frequencies, but it's also to determine the composition of the traffic. Uh, So that when you start to see the lobbying that comes on in this particular case, 
Don't think of it as simply a question of abuse at the agency level. Think of that one at least as a very serious defect in the design of the system at the constitutional level, at the congressional level, uh, when they didn't take the sensible position, which was to figure out how to assign sequences um, that are consistent with one another and then auction them off to use it for their higher use. That was a major congressional decision, and it is perfectly consistent with their view that these experts in government are entitled to do all sorts of other things and to simply uh, confine them to the humdrum function of the night watchman state, to use their own terminology, would be a desperate error. So what you do is you see the administrative agencies responding to the congressional commands and a judicial system which, since it's not particularly convinced about the merits of a property system anyhow, accommodating them up and down the line. So it becomes a very, very erratic position, and it's extremely difficult, therefore, uh, to generalize from one administrative scheme to another. Indeed, to generalize between one portion of the jurisdiction under a statute to another. So the rules that govern, for example, the control of air pollution under the EPA are very different in design and impact from the rules that govern water pollution. And it takes a very brave soul to be able to make uh, jumps from one kind of organization uh, to another. So it's a really a very complicated situation. And just like the federalism situation, it's not just there's a tendency, one powerful push that leads to regulatory capture. What is unleashed is a whole series of uh, initiatives by private and public parties alike, uh, which are constantly at war with one another. And you don't know the initial positions of all of the players, and therefore it's almost impossible in advance to predict what the outcomes will be. And it's also extremely difficult to know whether the courts are going to get their noses up at some of what these agencies do, or whether they're going to basically be highly compliant. So the position can only be described as expensive and chaotic. But there's one other word I would add, which is non-transparent. It, it, it's um, oh, that too, and, and the lack of accountability. The fact that if things don't go well, basically we're relying on that inner, not internecine. I was going to say internecine conflict. This, this um, wrangling uh, that takes place behind the scenes at, with the administrative court system is is just it's a bizarre way to run a country, which isn't certainly the way it was a while ago, but. It's the way it is now. Yeah, no, but, but Russ, it's, it's ironic. You use the word transparent and its lack. Uh, the way in which we've achieved non-transparency is to publish so much information before any one of these particular proceedings take place that nobody can figure out what it is that's going on. And so you get this outpouring of papers and stuff, and then since nobody can assimilate it, what happens is the serious work is done behind closed doors. So you do get a nod towards transparency, but Lord knows how the sausages are made to quote Bismarck. Yeah. Well, let's move on. Um in a recent episode of Econ Talk, I interviewed uh, Lewis Michael Seidman, who had argued at the time uh, in, a, in an op-ed, and I think it's based on his book, that we should just ignore the Constitution. It makes no sense to be beholden to a bunch of dead people who lived hundreds of years ago. They don't know anything about what we're doing. It's bizarre that we constrain ourselves that way. What was your reaction? I know you had one, uh, shockingly. Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> and, and I, I shockingly, a negative reaction. Well, it, my reaction was negative. It was by no means alone. I mean, uh, I don't even know what it is to ignore the Constitution. Um, do we start to say, in effect, that people can disregard the judgments of the Supreme Court? Uh, does it mean, in effect, that when Congress passes a law by, um, uh, say, less than a majority vote, that we're going to say, oh, 40 percent of the people are in favor of this in the House of Representatives? It's now a law. Certainly he doesn't mean all of that. Um, so then the question is, well, just what does he mean? And, and, you know, he was certainly in favor of giving various kinds of protections for the First Amendment speech. Well, that's got to be constitutional. And somehow it's got to be enforced. There is a movement on the left of which Seidman is a part, uh, his former colleague now at Harvard, Mark Tushnet is a part. Larry Kramer, who is the former dean of the Stanford Law School, is a part, which says, in effect, that what we have to do is to return to the principles of popular democracy in the way in which we elect our public officials is clear enough, but also in the way in which we pass our laws, so that for the most part, whatever comes out of the congressional or the state mill, if it is a reflection of, quote, the will of the people, then the courts ought to yield to it, because otherwise, to use Kramer's famous phrase, instead of having we the people, what we do is we have we the court deciding these things. Um, my own view about this is I just think it's much too crude. 
Uh, there is no question that any appropriate constitutional theory has to be able to find a series of structural constraints that existing legislatures are not in a position to avoid. But on the other hand, it has to give them sufficient power so as to be able to make sure that you could upgrade a government to deal with the, you know, the, uh, the technical and the legal and the moral challenges and the international challenges of a governed age. Uh, the issue that you'd want to then ask is, just exactly how it was that the folks in 1787 did not understand that exact precise dilemma and whether or not they picked a series of institutions and rules which actually gave you the needed flexibility where it was required, but gave you the needed structural regularities where that was required as well. So you have to be able to figure out whether or not they did a good or a bad job. So, for example, I think that the older device, wholly apart from the slavery question of having competition between states, in the organization of their general policies on such things as taxation, and then having the federal government with the power to make sure that no state could blockade trades across straight lines, that's a kind of a structure that works very well in the age of the internet and the airplane, the railroad, as it does in the horse and buggy stages. So that I don't think there was anything whatsoever wrong with that original structure of enumerated powers, and that the risk of faction, which later becomes the risk of public choice capture, is in fact one that was real in 1787, and it's one that's real today. So if you look at the Constitution and you sort of ask yourself which of its provisions seem to have durability that outlasts the time of their creation, I would say a very large fraction of them do, and the ones that clearly did not, the three-fifths clause on racial voting and the um, fugitive slave provisions that dealt with the duty to return escaped slaves to their owners and so forth, you know, those things are all gone. Does this mean that we have a perfect Constitution? No. But ironically, if you then start to figure out what some of the great achievements are, it's actually through more judicial intervention rather than less. Let me give you one example. Uh, if you look at the Constitution on this key question of interstate trade, uh, it says Congress shall have the power to regulate trade amongst the several states. And, and what typically happens is Congress doesn't regulate trade very much amongst the several states. And what the states then try to do is to create all sorts of barriers to make it more difficult for merchants out of state to compete with local people. And what the Supreme Court has done under the so-called Dormant Commerce Clause, it has basically inferred that in the absence of congressional legislation, it is its duty to essentially make sure uh, that we preserve the basic outlines of a competitive economic union, much the way the early economic union was in Europe, so that states cannot impose differential barriers on foreign trade and commerce or foreign merchants coming inside the state, so as to create a nationwide common market instead of having a balkanized market with either 13 or 50 states. It's been a great intellectual achievement. Uh, they make it very clear that this doesn't allow you to you know, emit poisons into the rivers of another state or to introduce native wild species into a particular community which will kill all the local fish and habitat. Essentially what they did is they invented a classical liberal doctrine. Now, if you take Seidman seriously, then presumably you're going to go back to the kind of state relationships which essentially allow you to have this provincialization take place. And I can't think of anybody who would really want to uh, do that. You're going to get rid of judicial review. You're going to have to say, gee, well, really, shouldn't the people in the state of South Carolina decide whether or not they want to continue with segregation? And oh, by the way, why do we want to have any federal oversight or constitutional oversight over who's allowed to vote? in state elections and so forth. So it becomes almost grotesque to sort of put this forward as a general concern. And the correct way in which to do it is to break it down into smaller questions and say, is this an area in which you think either as a matter of existing constitutional law or as a matter of general constitutional theory, uh, you think in fact the courts have gone too far? And you know, take one case where that's arguably so. Should the federal government uh, or should the federal courts, the United States Supreme Court, have the power to tell states how to organize their prison system? And I certainly think that the Constitution has gone way too far in an area that Seidman might be in favor of, which is the ability under the so-called cruel and unusual punishments clause uh, to essentially say that it is no longer permissible in the United States uh, to execute somebody um, if it turns out that he's guilty of child rape. You know, there are all sorts of normative judgments that the Supreme Court makes on capital punishment, which bear no relationship to the judgment of we the people. And yet, somehow or other, I don't know whether or not Seidman thinks it's a bad thing or a good thing. I think that's a case of judicial access.
But on the other hand, allowing a zoning law which confiscates property effectively to pass unchallenged, I think, is a sign of judicial abnegation. So I just don't see this one directional situation on any relevant issues, which allows me to say there's too much court or too little court. Well, I take this at a retail level, not at a wholesale level. Yeah, The problem I have with it, uh, with the formulation you gave, with the Kramer formulation, is that this idea that there's such a thing as the will of the people is a bizarre intellectual concept to me since most of us don't agree on many things. And um, the, any attempt to aggregate our preferences inher is inherently imperfect and that aggregation should only take place when it's absolutely necessary or a strong improvement because most of the time it's a form of – it's a way to redistribute among people. So uh, – but let, let me give Seidman his due and, and challenge you. Okay. He makes a good point, I think, that the constitution uh, only constrains legislation and behavior infrequently in the modern era. And maybe it would be better to be more honest about its real role in our lives. So there's certain areas – so the First Amendment, I think, and that's why he likes it, um, and I, I'm a fan of it too. Uh, Second Amendment, he's – I'm not sure he's – I think he's also a fan of that actually also. But you know, we can, we, can, uh, we can disagree about which are the good amendments, which are the bad amendments. But I think – am I wrong in saying that there are only a few of them that really matter, uh, that most of the time whatever Congress wants to do, it does anyway. And the Congress just – we just go along. You know, There's no – uh, to quote my uh, – he's actually 15. I misspoke. He, I, he got a year older while we're doing the podcast. You know, to quote my 15-year-old, okay. my 15-year-old says, you know, why is marijuana illegal? Why is that constitutional or trans fats in New York City or you name it? Wh what gives the government the right to stop me from eating or consuming what I want to consume? And of well, course the answer is most people just say, well, because it's good. It's good law. Um, but we don't really use the constitution. We just use in a way Seidman's – vague uh, idea that, well, if it's good, if it's if people like it, that's what we should do. We shouldn't be constrained. Do you think that's well, true? Well, I mean, it's by, I mean, look, I mean, you know, one of the things is that people don't know whether they want the courts to intervene or to back off. And in the cases that you're given, you would love to have a judicial decision which says it is not within the competence of the state in the exercise of its police power uh, to tell you what you can and cannot eat. What it's supposed to do under its police power is to make sure that people don't get killed in street fights and to make sure that poisons aren't circulated throughout the system. Uh, but if you have ordinary food and there's an issue of overconsumption, that becomes an individual matter rather than a collective matter to solve. Well, that's an argument for having strong constitutional interventions, not for having weak ones. So your son is on both sides of the issue, as is everybody else. One of the great things that happened with the Kelo case was that what the Supreme Court said that you are taking land for public use if you're going to transfer it from one private party to another. And most people said this is the most outrageous form of judicial activism. But it was exactly the opposite. It was a situation in which the court knew that this was not a public use transfer and nonetheless said it's up for the state to decide whether or not to allow it. And we could always make it for public use because every transfer will have some indirect public benefit. Well, if that's the test, then – and every transfer has it. The limitation is de facto read out of the Constitution. Correct. So people who get indeed – you know, get indignant about this often just – whenever they don't like a decision, they call it judicial activism, even when they're cases of complete judicial passivity. So again, I'm just going to repeat what I think to be the case, which is that what you need to do is to find in particular areas where courts should intervene and where not. So let me just give you one simple example. What do you do with taxation? Well, I think it would be absolutely crazy for somebody to say, well, the United States Constitution means, A, uh, that the average tax level can never be more than 4%, no matter whether you're at war or in times of peace. Uh, that would be crazy. Or that the total budget that could be spent for all times can never be more than a billion dollars. You know, there is a $20 provision about jury trials in the Seventh Amendment to the Constitution. But I think it's perfectly sensible uh, for somebody to say, look, under our Constitution, if you want to eliminate the kinds of political discretion that can be eat you alive, what you have to do is to have a broad tax base and the tax rates have to be flat. And if you did that, it would be a complete transformation of modern American politics at the federal level. Just think of what would happen in the debate about the top 1%. You could no longer have it. Uh, you would be in the same position that Illinois and uh, Massachusetts, both ill-governed states, are with respect to this. But that's a judicially enforceable limit. It makes a big difference. And it does not trench upon your ability to raise whatever revenues you think you need in order to discharge the uh, important functions 
of the day. So that's a classic case in which on the matter of you know, rate, it seems to me that you would want to have complete congressional control, but on the matter of rate structure, you would want to have very strong judicial control. That's the same very issue. So to kind of argue that I'm in favor of restraint or I'm in favor of uh, judicial restraint or judicial activism becomes idle. You can disaggregate the debate, figure out how in accordance with general principles of political theory, you give people enough discretion to run the government, but not so much to run it into the ground, which is what we're doing today. Look, you know as well as I do, Russ, there is no major tax rate currently in place which has a half-life of more than two years. They all get changed, and they get changed in the intensity, the progressivity, the kinds of taxes we impose or whatever. So we had a compromise just this past year in which we raised the estate tax up to $5 million and then give a cost of living increase. And now it turns out the president comes back and says, I don't like that. Well, let's go back to $3,500,000 and a higher bracket for the taxable stuff. So his attitude is, I conceded on this point in 2013, in the beginning of the year, and now I'm perfectly okay that we can pass the statute so that by 2018 or 17, it goes back into a position that is radically different from the one that we have. How do people plan against that kind of erratic behavior? Now, that, that is a problem. Uh, I'd certainly prefer a more stable tax environment, and I'd prefer a flatter uh, tax environment and a broader base mm -hmm. uh, tax, and a more transparent mm -hmm. tax system where we don't have this weird – payroll tax thing that people think is for their old age, but their other federal activities gets funded out of the income tax when, in fact, they both get pooled mm -hmm. together. Yeah, there, mm -hmm. There's a lot of problems. Um, but let me ask you one other follow-up to the Sideman issue that came up, which I thought was very provocative, which is okay. – it, it, I'm not sure how it came up, but it, it's something I think about a lot, which is that we have this romance about the court uh, that that – Members of the court have these philosophies. We have these people with strict constructionist views. We have people with more progressive views, people more mm -hmm. liberal in terms of how the Constitution yeah. can be interpreted. Um, what do you think of this uh, – what I would call the more realistic view, which is the view I've increasingly come to in most areas of human thinking, which is people have a bunch of biases and ideologies and philosophies – and they do what they want, and then they cook up the reason later. You know, they, they, They're not really seeking the truth when they go out to examine a court case. They know what they're going to come to. They just have to find the cases that support that, that view. In what sense does the Supreme Court, do the justices of the Supreme Court do what, what we might call real jurisprudence, where they, they go and find out what the, you know, what, what, the, what the record says, what are the precedents, as opposed to just you know, figuring out what they want, where they want to go, and they'll write the roadmap as they go along? Yes, I mean, I think it's all too common. It's a very difficult question in general. I mean, because you don't want to say, in effect, that people who do this are being completely incoherent and Perhaps. inconsistent. One of the, you know, one of the things that's so interesting about this is if you figure out what the progressive intellectual agenda was on individual rights, federalism, separation of powers in the administrative states, their decisions are perfectly coherent with respect to that basic set of principles. And it's exactly the same thing could be said with respect to us classical liberals. The reason why I scream is that this is not a debate in pure political theory. You've got yourself a text there. Um, I think, in fact, it does have certain strong commitments to it. And all those commitments were drafted by people who thought about the world in the way in which I do, rather than the way in which they do. And yet somehow they always manage to win when it comes to the question of what these words mean. And it's I believe that the descriptive that you've given, that is that people have their political preferences, and then what they do is they organize a judicial theory around it, is in fact correct. But I've never been able to get past the simple point uh, that sometimes you're wrong when you do this, and sometimes you're right. One of the tests that you always give yourself is to ask whether or not uh, you are creating the sort of the world's perfect constitution in which no matter what's written there, you always end up with something which is perfectly in accordance with it your was, own belief. With you like and yeah. so you. Yeah, so you want to find out whether or not there's something you think which is written there or which disagrees with something that you clearly favor. And I constantly ask myself that question. And so, for example, if we go back to this Commerce Clause illustration, and the question is whether or not in 1787 there was a protectionist constitution against foreign trade, the answer to that question is unambiguously yes. Yes. 
Um, Hamilton was a mercantilist. He was a highly influential fever. He, he said, in effect, if you read Federalist Number 11, that one of the reasons why we have this federal commerce power with respect to foreign commerce is so we can have a, foreign, a united front against them. Um, foreign states. Otherwise, we're at the mercy of the market forces in the way in which we regulate our own internal economy. I think this is just terrible prose. Bad idea. But I have no doubt of what they did. Um, to give you another illustration on the question of whether or not there's judicial supremacy, you, know, you read closely what the Constitution says about the creation of the federal court system, and it's just not in there. Uh, you go back and you check the way in which Montesquieu and Locke described the separation of powers, and the judicial role was to protect individual rights in accordance with the laws that were passed by the Congress and enforced by the executive. It was never to veto or to overset those laws. And yet we certainly have read since Marbury and Madison and Martin against Hunter's Let's See the thing in exactly the opposite direction. And, you know, I think it was wrong as a matter of original interpretation. And that gets you to a second problem which is suppose you've done this wrong and it works and you've done it for 200 years. So I'm not the guy who's going to come along and say, you know, Marbury v. Madison is wrong. What we have to do is to overrule it. Um, I think what happens is constitutional law has two things to deal with this sort of incipient illegitimacy that gets ratified by past use. One is originalism, that is the text and the various modes of construction. And the other is what I call in my new book, the prescriptive constitution, i.e., if somebody trespasses on your land, he's a wrongdoer, right, Russ? He does it for 20 years. He's a new owner. Yeah, he's a, yeah. um, that's exact, I mean, that's the doctrine of prescription. And so it is if you start with a constitution, somebody does something which is rather gutsy and probably incorrect, and then people acquiesce in it over a long period of time, that becomes the new constitution. Let's Not in every case, but in many cases. So that you know, no originalist that I'm aware of wants to go back to the original constitution on Marbury or on Martin and Hunter's lessee that is dealing with the state, the power of the United States Supreme Court to invalidate state or federal laws. And so you have to be very much aware of this and then ask the question, well, what counts as legitimate long use? You know, Plessy v. Ferguson's a pretty long decision. It was in power for 58 years and was struck down by the Supreme Court. I think the long and the short of that is that it was never a decision whose legitimacy was widespread, accepted, uh, particularly as segregation became more and more ugly. So now what you have is even a worse world. You have to have a prescriptive constitution with some selective judgment as to which things last and which ones don't. And I think you can do that. What I don't think you could do is do it in an error-free fashion. Yeah, well, there's a certain Hayekian aspect to to that uh, prescription view, right? It says Absolutely. Yeah. stuff that persists ha must have something good about it. And as you say, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> uh, or there may be a reason it persists that isn't because it's good and unchallenged, but uh, it's it's not a – it's an interesting place to start. Um, one more question for my, my uh, ninth grader. Uh, what is the elastic clause? This is a dangerous kid. Yeah, no, yes. He's, he's, he's dangerous. That's right. Uh, what's the elastic clause and uh, what's your view of it? What does he, what does he ask? I think he's – I think he's asking about the necessary and proper that's, clause. That's correct. What is that? Uh, well, it's the if you look at the organization of the federal constitution, it's a principle of enumerated powers. And then at the end of this thing, in the last clause, it says, and each of the departments of government shall have all of those powers, necessary and proper powers, to carry into execution the aforementioned powers. And, and so what happens is it's an enumerated powers doctrine with a twist. And the question is just how big is the twist that we have to add in? And when John Marshall interpreted this provision in a case called McCullough in Maryland, he said that the words necessary and proper, when taken together, mean appropriate. And that clearly, as a linguistic matter, lowers the level of scrutiny uh, that can be brought to any particular action of Congress. So if you think that something is necessary, it means that you can't do without it, and proper, meaning that it manages to accord with all sorts of other prohibitions in the Constitution. Appropriate means a much looser connection. And the proof of the pudding is in the case that he was dealing with, which was the question as to whether or not the Congress had the power to create a national bank. Um, so if you look at the individual powers, what you do is you don't see a bank there. You see the power to regulate commerce and the power to issue credit and the power to run a mint. And so what Marshall said is, you know, all of those things work a lot better if you can have a national bank. 
And so therefore, it's appropriate to have them in the bank as constitutional. There was a big debate earlier on as to whether or not the clause could be read that broadly. It was a Hamilton for, I think it was Madison against. My view about it is that our friend um, Marshall misread the clause. He was, in fact, a champion of the strong federal government. Indeed, the best illustration is there's a young fellow who's about to enter into teaching named Will Bort who wrote this very interesting paper in which he said, well, is it necessary and proper for the federal government and the states to be able to condemn land to build post roads? And you would have thought the answer is, how could you build a post road unless you could condemn the land? But the practice seems to have been otherwise. And the rule was that if you have two sovereigns, a state sovereign and a federal sovereign, what the federal government had to do was to ask the state to condemn the land and then turn it over to it. So that that gives you an exceedingly narrow reading of this clause. And it's not a what you would call a an elastic clause. It's a clause which says, for example, if the United States has to find places for people to live in Washington, D.C., they can essentially give people stipends, even though there's nothing in the Constitution which talks about stipends stipends for housing allowances. And uh, you know, I think at that point, uh, the great battle is you really need to say that because traditional views of construction would always give you those additional powers anyhow. And so this became a clarification. But when you get to the 1930s, all of a sudden people are saying necessary and power is the way in which you understand the legitimacy of the administrative state. So instead of having three branches of government, you can now have what is called the fourth branch of government in addition. It's a huge transformation in the way things work. And this again shows you why constitutional law is so perilous. You get something, you know, and you don't know what it means, and your son asks you a question, you have no idea of the huge stakes that are involved. And the one thing you could say about all great American constitutional scholars is they understand how significant the issues that they debate in a way that the public does not. And so with the necessary and proper clause, you get the administrative state. If it turns out that Congress allows you the Commerce Clause allows you to regulate those things which affect interstate commerce, even if they're not in interstate commerce. That seems to you like a matter of words. Well, you can set prices in the agricultural markets under one way, and you can't set them under the other. So that the battle over the two meanings of the Commerce Clause is a way of expanding federal power by an order of magnitude, at least, if not more. Uh, so that's why these things make such a difference. And my views from the classical liberal constitution is if you're trying to figure out under the species of eternity how you put these things together, understanding the recurrent dangers of political order and the recurrent problems associated with faction, the 1787 constitution was actually more sophisticated than the 1937 constitution. And part of the reason why we have such a malaise now is there's such a concentration of power at Washington that it's a huge target for every interest group in town to come there. And essentially, as you said at the beginning of the hour, you can't create wealth if all you're interested in doing is transferring it from one party to another. Uh, sigh. Okay, so... Um, sigh, sigh, sigh. sigh. The Go long, ahead, sigh. Uh, yeah, long sigh. But um, it crosses my mind as I ask a guest from time to time this, a variant of this question that, you know, we get the Constitution we deserve. You and I... We like the Constitution of 1787. Other people like the 1937 one or the 2007. And mm -hmm. you know, we don't have many people agree with us. So it's just there are these underlying political forces that, you know, again, all these ideas about theories of judicial interpretation. That's just window dressing. What's really going on is the president picks Supreme Court, nominates Supreme Court justices mm -hmm. that are politically popular and. Basically, the ones that are politically popular because the president wants to be popular and his party wants him to be popular are going to be justices that don't have the, quote, right theory of, of the Constitution, mm -hmm. but who open the door to the laws that most people – legislation that most people want. And what most people want is a more active federal government. So well, uh, most people – What do I think about that? Yeah, I think, think most people that? want – I think most people want a more active federal government to advance the particular cause that they champion and a smaller federal government with respect to all those things which harm them so greatly. Yeah. And so what happens is you can still get large numbers of people who will quote to you Gerald Ford when he says the government is just big enough to give you everything you want, is big enough to take away everything that you have. And most people straddle that particular kind of an insight, so they don't know which way they're on. But that's why all of these academic debates, so-called, are so absolutely important, uh, because quite simply, um, the stakes are enormous – 
it's very clear that there is no sort of automatic guardian of the public welfare that sits outside human beings uh, by divine origin or divine power to structure these things. So what you have to do is to change the climate of opinion in the hopes that once you do that, you'll be able to change the input of the judges on the court. And, and remember, it is very common for justices on the United States support Supreme Court to shift one way or another. Harry Blackman started out in some senses as a Nixon appointee, and he does the abortion cases because he worked for the Mayo Clinic. And by God, by the time he's done, he's a member of the liberal faction. Indeed, if you look at the Supreme Court, there are many conservative presidents who appointed liberal justices. I think I did a rough calculation once that between, say, 1956 and 2005, roughly speaking, uh, what you could say was that on average each year there were three justices appointed to the Supreme Court by conservative presidents who turned out to have deeply liberal sentiments. And yeah, that my, would include my theory of that. My theory of that is they like to go to the good parties. So after you've been in Washington in a while and most people are mm -hmm. not like you, you figure, well, this isn't any fun. Slightly cynical. Sorry. Carry on. Yeah, I know that, but you know, not with Bill, not with Bill Brennan. He was uh, Eisenhower appointed him because he thought in 1956 he needed to solidify his base in New Jersey. He later described it as the worst political miscalculation of his career. Um, Earl Warren was in fact part of a political deal that if he backed Eisenhower in '52, he would get the next open seat, and it just happened to be the Chief Justiceship of the United States Supreme Court. Uh, um, Stevens, I know, who's a very distinguished judgment, was a buddy of Edward Levy, and that. Had a huge amount to do with it, and Edward was a progressive Republican, and so did it turn out was our friend uh, Stevens. Uh, David Souter was, you know, sworn to by Warren Rudman to be a man that would be sound, and uh, it turned out that the first Bush believed him, and he got himself 20 years of relatively left of center justice. Does it ever go the other and way? Been, Does it ever go the uh, other well, way? Well, uh, <laughs> First of all, the political – your party theory – no, it tends to be as people get on the court, they tend to veer to the left. Yeah, that's what that that's consistent certainly, with my party theory. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I mean Sandra Day O'Connor certainly was a more liberal justice towards the end of her term than she was at the beginning. Same thing could be said even of uh, – uh, Bill Rehnquist. Uh, somebody like Byron White is a kind of a complicated character uh, because he was very far to the left on labor issues, on which he was much further to the left than Bill Brennan. But on the other hand, he was very conservative on moral kinds of questions, police power, abortion. Uh, so he was conservative on some issues. It was not a case in his situation of a transformation. I think that's the way he was when he took office in the early 1960s and he remained that way until he resigned some years later. Now, I mean, you know, it's a complicated set of mixtures, but there's no question uh, that the age of miscalculation, as one might call it, I think is over now. Uh, if you look at the current Supreme Court, every one of the nine of them is performing in accordance with type, except possibly for Kennedy. And he was appointed, of course, 25 years ago. But even he, you know, on the Commerce Clause stuff, everybody said he was the doubtful man. And he came out, essentially completely transformed the earlier argument when he just asked a very innocent question. Does Congress have the power to create commerce in order to regulate it? I mean, you know, that was tough stuff. So it's a, it's a look, the theme to end with on the hour is that we all have simple theories which explain some portion. But the closer you look at any of the particular issues, the more complicated the cross currents turn out to be. Uh, so as a descriptive matter, it's very hard to figure out how the capture theory works under this current constitution that we have. And as a normative theory, it's very difficult to figure out which way the justices are going to start to come down on the really big cases that shape and define a nation. So let me let me close with a rhetorical question I have here written down, which was uh, yeah. it's, kind of, it's kind of comical. Is there anything important you have to say about the Constitution I haven't asked you about? And so it's a rhetorical question. I know the answer is yes. Uh, yes. Why don't, you, why don't you close with with some final thoughts? And you might want to mention which direction we think we're going. Uh, we okay. Well, we, we certainly you and I would be would like to be closer to 1787. Um, see hmm. anything moving us in that direction? Well, I mean, you know, for example, the single most momentous issues before the court right now are the gay marriage issue. Um, which is a judicial fabrication designed to create a, a new set of social rights. Politically, I'm very sympathetic with it, given my libertarian organization. But in terms of the structural history of the American Constitution, I'm highly doubtful that you can squeeze this into the Equal Protection Clause as it was understood in 1868. The Supreme Court, I predict, will in effect move fairly substantially in the direction of creating constitutional 
equal protection rights with respect to gay marriage. And this is originalism on the one hand is against at this point a, a nascent um, libertarianism coming out on guns. I'm, I'm a dissenter from the general view on the Second Amendment. I think it's largely a structural position, which is intended to protect the federal government from regulating the way arms are used in the state so as to allow the states to organize their militias, uh, which is done in Article 1. Um, but today it's read as a freestanding right, and the militia portion of it has just dropped out. I don't think that's originalism in my view, and I think Justice Scalia was wrong, and ironically on originalist grounds, uh, Justice um, Stevens, who wrote the dissent, was probably correct. It's you know a, not a particularly well-drafted amendment, but I think that's the best that you can do with respect to reading it. Uh, so you get uh, these kinds of cross-currents taking place. As I mentioned to you on cruel and unusual punishments with an S, I think the Supreme Court is just marching to its own drum without any constitutional authorization on the one hand and without any popular support on the other, and it's a mistake. And, you know, when you start then going down the list of economic stuff, uh, the extent to which we tolerate extensive economic regulation over various aspects of the economy at the state and the federal level, I think we're engaged in acts of self-strangulation as a nature, which are very inconsistent with the protections of property and contract that were built into the original structure on the grounds that when you're worried about excessive concentrations of power, you can't put all of your faith in one kinds of remedies so that in a very deep sense, Hamilton was wrong when he said that you know the structures are the protections for civil rights and the guys who wanted the Bill of Rights in 1791 were correct when they said that a certain degree of redundancy is needed and the great peril that we have today is I think there's too much of a public consensus too much of a public consensus in favor of the view that you know government gives us more than it takes from us and so long as that general attitude exists we're going to have rough sledding and we already know that even though the stock market hit 15,000 today, uh, this has been a very slow and very difficult recovery. And we also know that most of the interactions that were taken in the 1930s prolonged rather than lessened the depression, which lasted well into the middle of World War II. And it was because of most of the Roosevelt policies, not the spending policies, but the regulatory policies. And I think the single largest issue in the Constitution that we have to face today is whether or not the judicial system will assert its control over federal regulation, which I think is ruinous to the organization and advancement of competitive economic ideals. My guest today has been Richard Epstein. Richard, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you for having me. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.